So, welcome back. Today we are in a beautiful part of southern Iowa, uh, actually southeast Iowa. I do believe it's, the town, little town's called Yarmouth, and we're visiting with Zach today. Now there's no, uh, no real secret that we've had a really oddball growing season this year. Uh, extreme dryness early in the spring. Luckily we've been catching some of the rains back home. Uh, Zach is the agronomist for Syngenta. We're gonna be looking at what are some of the things that we could be looking for for disease coming on this year. Uh, talking about fungicide trials, maybe some insects that we might need to be looking for this year or late season diseases that could be rearing their head like sudden death and things along those lines. I usually go to one of these every single year just to know what maybe some of the things that we're gonna be facing are. And you might think, well, why do you go to one every single year? Well, that's because every single year, the growing seasons are different. And because they're different, we face different challenges every single year. And sometimes you have to decide, are you gonna do late season fungicide applications because the disease pressure is coming in? Or are you going, or if you're gonna maybe cut out that expense for this year. Most years, we decide to apply a fungicide. Let's see what we're facing this year. There's the man. How are you? Good, how are you doing? So if you know I haven't met Zach, Zach's from Help Me Out Before. Mm -hmm. uh, Zach's probably pretty disappointed that I now have his phone number because I text and call <laughs> him with all my oddball questions. But uh, we were, I was telling YouTube that today we might want to kind of look through the oddball growing season a yeah. little bit. Maybe see what we got coming on this year for disease pressure, mm -hmm. what we might want to see. And maybe fungicides that we might want to consider applying because the haggies and airplanes are rolling right now. Oh yeah, there's a lot of stuff flying around. Actually, I think we'll get buzzed a few times here today. Hey, so. there we go. So this is uh, about a five acre site overall. Um, what we have here is just a whole host of different crop protection products. Um, you know, chemicals via nutritional products, uh, fungicides, insecticides, everything that you can imagine that you're going to look at applying on your farm, we try to put out in this plot. Um, so kind of starting up front, we got some fungicide stuff up there. We're more in the herbicide section right now. Actually, this, is, uh, this has probably been kind of the, the biggest thing everybody's been talking about this year is water hemp, right? Yeah. Water hemp just not dying. And then, uh, you know, kind of as we go further back, we move more into the nutritional side of things. So that's kind of always the, the fun thing to kind of end on is looking at nutritionals. And, you know, that's been a big hot topic the past few years. So, you know, looking at just these plots, actually, I was working on these before you, you walked up. This is really talking about why have we seen a lot of issues this year around weed control, especially, right? I mean, I don't know. That's something that every grower I think I've talked to this year has said weed control has been a pain. And last year too right i mean that was that was a oh, big yes. thing that we've all talked about so um you know kind of starting off when we look at these uh these plots i put out a bunch of different timings and what i really wanted to show with this whole thing is just not really focusing on products but focusing on what do weeds actually do to our crops why are weeds so bad right mm -hmm. i mean what are, what are they doing um you know my favorite thing when you start out up here just looking at, you know, this is uh, this would be something that you commonly find um, on maybe, you know, some terrace ground, right? A one pass program pre, right? We don't want to run over our crop. Nope. That's losing bushels and stuff. But what are, what are we going to notice on this these kind of plants um, right away? We see a, a lot of weeds in there. A lot of right? weeds in there. <laughs> but also... What are we starting to see on our corn? We're starting to see some deficiency showing up. And that's nitrogen deficiency. Is that, or is so that a potash? This is potash deficiency, so, yeah. So the difference in between, if you look at a leaf, between a nitrogen deficiency and a potash, mm -hmm. nitrogen comes from the inside. Yep. And potash kind of starts to yellow from the outside. Yep, you're going to see it working from the okay. outside there. Is any of this nitrogen or potash deficiency because of the dryness? A little bit would be um, in this plot. So what we'll see is you'll actually see less of that as we go through. That's obviously getting a little bit more severe, right? We're starting to actually see it getting uh, really uh, starting to move in. That's really because of what the weeds are stealing from that crop. It's ste they're stealing moisture, making it even drier. And then we're losing some of our nutrients there okay. from the weeds actually stealing it. Okay. So a little bit of both there. The dryness, you've probably seen that too. I mean, you guys are always dealing with the drought there in Southern Iowa. Um, you know, you always find a little bit of it, but this is definitely where we're starting to move into more of a, you know, hey, is this going to keep progressing? And more than likely you'll see this progress. And I have it way worse than a few other plots too. One thing that Zach and I have talked about multiple times, we're a two pass herbicide program, mm -hmm. mainly because things like that one pass program for us 
seems to some years you can maybe get it to hold some yeah. years but most years you're gonna be oh i've got weeds out there and you're gonna have to spray again so we've just went to a two press pass program and it's been like that mm -hmm. one thing that we definitely want to talk about is with the dryness this year what are some of the diseases that we're going to see later on but we'll check out the rest of this yeah uh, herbicide plot real quick yeah absolutely we're going to talk about some diseases that's a that's a good one because we do have some diseases actually showing up already but so what i what i did with all these is i have some different herbicide timings out here as we walk down i think the big thing that we start to see is when we get out to these plots here you're going to start seeing the pressures again what are we trying to do we're trying to kill a bunch of herbicide or a bunch of weeds post emergence we're just not able to do that yeah again we look at this dry weather you know this this program we're going to show you this product in a two pass program the same exact program here with a two pass and it looks completely different but what what you'll see here too as we look and it's gonna be you probably won't be able to pick it up on the camera but you'll be able to definitely see it is this corn starts to get really short yeah, that's because of all this stress we were under that drought too yeah but then again we look at this we were trying to kill two foot weeds and we know you just can't do that no no matter what what herbicide this is you can't kill a two foot water hemp anymore so i guess there's one thing that i can relate to what we were seeing this year was since we were so dry those plants were just stressing so hard mm -hmm. when they were little yep and we almost didn't want to just hit the plants because of add more stress of spraying over the top mm -hmm. and while we thought well the weeds can't be growing as fast as they were or whatever and so we got into some weeds that were a little bit taller than we would normally get luckily we got them pretty yeah. well killed off but we're in a two pass program so we didn't have a big flush of weeds there yeah. but what are guys is is that an issue too that people were holding off a little bit because the corn wasn't growing as fast or what else happened well, like i said this is a very oddball growing year i mean this oh, yeah. corn here is only eight foot tall it's like that's relatively kind of short corn and yeah this is really good dirt where we're at too yeah this is this is extremely extremely productive dirt i mean last year we were pushing upper 200 bushel crop on this on this dirt here but you know it really goes back to this this odd year everything grew so slow but the thing about water hemp it doesn't really care about drought right it's actually native to texas that's where water hemp was first you know uh kind of grew at and then it moved up here to the midwest this was actually a texas year right i mean it kind of felt like texas 95 degrees no humidity this water hemp just kept growing with this and then when this crop started to grow up and everybody said all right let's go pull the trigger I think we saw a lot more of this. I mean, you can even see where this the actual herbicide hit the hit these weeds, you know, these little yep. you know, you know, this stuff up. right here really burnt them, but that guy's still alive at the end of the day and he yep. could still produce a seed head. So, this water hemp just really tough, but so you're talking about two pass, right? That's something you're into with your farm. We Biggest thing that we just learned though is that our water hemp problem comes from Texas. So it's Texas's <laughs> fault. <laughs> Absolutely, it's Texas's <laughs> fault. Um, but you know, this is that same herbicide post program, but we added a pre to it, and we can see major difference. Major, major, major difference. difference. So I always hear, is it really our, you know, our post products fault? I could put any single herbicide here, and it's going to struggle with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we were just spraying into, right? That's like spraying into a jungle. But this right here, when we start adding a pre, and all these have pre's underneath them, you see that program just change and our results are much different. Yep, so. and if you look at the bottom leaves on this, much healthier looking corn plant. Yep, overall, I mean, we got a healthier corn plant. We can see the height right now. We're back into that, getting up towards 10 foot tall corn. You know, um, hopefully we don't get a huge wind like some sometimes we have <laughs> in the past, but there's not a tree around here. There's a grain bin that's about it to block our, block our wind. But uh, you can see this corn, nice healthy tall what we're looking for well on its way to a really good crop over there i think we're gonna see yeah we lost a lot of bushels from that so um start clean and stay clean that's yeah. that's your best program zach's told me multiple times doesn't matter start your season to see the weeds get them gone that's yep. that's basically his program yeah i try to i try to spray black dirt as much as possible <laughs> <laughs> These are all, again, two pass programs. They all look relatively the same. You know, some of these, um, you know, you gotta get out of the edge because obviously the edge is just mm -hmm. getting sunlight. You get in there though, nice clean crop, exactly what a grower is gonna want to experience. So, um, you know, this is this is a tough site. Um, it's got a lot of pressure in it, but it just shows that if I can control the weeds on this field with this kind of pressure, and I mean, it's, it's pretty obscene, 
it's really possible to control it on any farm. Just sometimes we got to look at where we're spending our money, where we're making that investment at. So, so what's your favorite pre, pre and post program right now? With so the chemicals on the market. My favorite pre program is actually down here. We can walk down and look at it. Um, we have a, we have a product called Lumax, and what I like about Lumax is, you know, just how that product's actually designed. It's got multiple modes of action um, in the in the dirt. So we got uh, uh, Callisto, Dual, and Atrazine. Here it is actually, right here. Um, so, oh, sorry, this is Lexar. I think Blue Max is. One more? One more, one more. We're gonna get there eventually. Was that the sign you had in your hand? Yeah, when I actually walked up? it was. <laughs> I think I forgot <laughs> so to put we'll it down. The sign. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so this would be uh, Lou Max right here, um, followed by the Acuron GT. And really, um, very clean acre again, with really, really, really heavy pressure. But what I like about it, it's got three modes of action in the dirt for water hemp, and it's got a really good robust post program. Um, so this has been a program really successful. Again, we're getting towards the edge of this plot where this pressure is definitely, you know, it's like your fields, right? You yep. get to the edge, the pressure gets skyrocketed and it's holding that pressure back really well. So I think that's something that, you know, as I've looked at this plot and I've, I've been really impressed with that Lumax followed by Acuron GT program. Really, really something that, you know, I would look at if I was farming a tough acre, that would be my program right there. And what I take from when Zach says tough acre is, is that, our, we stride every year to have no weeds growing out there. And the more years that we get that, the less and less weed bank there is for us to have to contend with um, versus maybe you rent a new farm and there's been a lot of water hemp out there and they've had a water hemp problem. problem. That's gonna be a tough acre because there's gonna be an immense amount of water hemp pressure out there in the field versus having a field that's been in control for numerous years and that's what that's what i think when you say tough absolutely acre. okay absolutely i mean i i get to deal with all sorts of acres seed corn acres we know those are always the tough ones right but um you know this this isn't becoming uncommon we look at some soybean fields you can tell what the tough acre is going to be the next year by just how weedy that soybean field is yeah. but one thing from the dry june dry spring basically yep is that if you're having problems with your weed control um a lot of people were oh, it's, yeah. it's that's one thing that threw this year into a loop and could also be something that actually decreases our yield even if you made it into the spots that have been catching some rains which have you been catching the rains here yeah we caught about uh, i think in the past month we've actually caught about two and a half inches of rain which i think was about the first over an inch rainfall we've caught since planting yep so, so he, uh, he's and you guys are very much so in the same boat as we are absolutely other than instead of having 50 csr dirt you're probably high 70s here uh it's closer to 90. holy <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is, this is this is some sacred soil right here. <laughs> we're in a very nice part of southern iowa <laughs> we'll head off to uh the next plot so we're not here really to look at cover crops today but one thing that I've talked about personally is I like cover crops. There's no doubt that they do good things for the soil, prevent erosion, build organic matter, suppress weeds, things along those lines. But I've also talked about the risk that it brings on to the producer for your actual cash crop. And Zach's actually got a really good example, actually two examples here of what can happen to your cash crop by trying to grow a cover crop. So you wanna explain the, I guess we can start with the beans yeah. and then we can go look at the corn real quick. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a really, uh, uh, an interesting thing I tried to do. I tried to jam three three cover crop practices all in one plot here. So um, you can see we have some cover crop that we let get really tall. So what we did is we actually planted the cover crop, uh, or sorry, planted our soybeans into this cover crop here. And we let the soybeans try to grow up and get out of the ground. Um, and this rye was probably about three feet tall. Actually, it was just starting to head out when I terminated it. So this would have been a very late termination timing on, on most, uh, most cover crops here but you can see um you know talking about that risk on a really dry year this cover crop is going to soak out a lot of that moisture now in a normal year that's a great thing for us we mm -hmm. have a hard time to get some of these really heavy soils here in the midwest to dry out they cannot help you dry the soil out but at the same time on a dry year we can actually see we can lose our stand from yep. these cover crops and this is what cover croppers would want you to have is this big heavy yep. mat yeah this is this is their ideal get it to about seed time mm -hmm. tall and kill it off and then let it either fall down or 
I guess roll it down yeah. to. It depends on where you're planted at. A lot of people say plant green. Um, and then this becomes basically your weed mat. Like it falls down and puts straw on the ground and becomes your weed mat. That is what a cover cropper wants to see. Yep. Zach, is this planted? This is planted. Is there any beans in there? There are no beans in there. So That's, this this is almost probably the worst case scenario. I didn't. I could have came in and replanted it, but honestly, I thought it would be really good to kind of show that there's downsides to every single practice we try. I mean, even even herbicides have some downside to them. Now, I think this is what most guys would try to do if they were going to plant green: is plant green and then terminate it right away. And we can see, even you know, I planted. I think about a bushel and a half of rye out here. You got you um, got some bugs going on here, bud. Oh yeah, we got a lot of Japanese beetles out here. So, um, but you know, we can see we have a really good mat down here. Um, where there is a heavy mat, actually, we see some pretty good water hemp suppression. I mean, there's no water hemp out here, but there's a lot of grass that kind of came through. This is that dry year again. The grass pressure was pretty tough. So um, again, I don't retreat anything. I just let it be and just so say this is. What'd you terminate it with? I would have terminated this just Roundup. Just Roundup. Yep. So these would have different herbicide programs in them every 10 feet, but it was all terminated with Roundup. Okay. So, and then I think as we move forward up here, this is realistically what I see a lot of growers do the first year they try cover crops. Uh, we got to kind of get out of this grass pressure because it does get a little better and actually a little bit more representative. Um, but this would be actual um, terminated two weeks prior to planting. So we're trying to get some of that benefit of the cover crop drying out the soil. We terminated it with Roundup prior to planting. And actually, I would say these beans don't look too much different than, you know, our conventional tilled beans right over there. So those would have been hit with a, a field cultivator before planting. Uh, VT'd in the fall, field cultivated here this spring. This would have just been um, cover crop, no tilled in. And yeah. actually, I think they look pretty good. So. I think there's ways of managing it, but you really, I think the, the whole plaster it across to everyone's farm, that method doesn't work. As you know, what I can do here versus what we can do over in your farm, it can be a little bit different, right? Yep. And that's where, again, I loop back to, I say doing cover crop on a few acres or a percentage of your farm every year is a good thing. Um, maybe pick some tougher acres where cover crops will really benefit that piece of ground. Uh, but you're bringing on expense and you're bringing on risk yep. to your cash crop, but you also could harvest the benefit. How tall do you think the cereal rye was here when you terminated it? About eight inches. About eight inches. Yep. So at eight inches, how much benefit does the cereal rye actually do for the ground is, you know, yeah. the, the, you, you, can, you can see that there was maybe something here for a little while, yeah. but the, the actual straw mat, it, it's, it's not there anymore. Yep. So that's why big time cover croppers say big straw mat is what they want and it's all big give take ebb and flow yep. so and every year is going to be different every year is going to be different so i'd say if i would have done this last year the really wet year we had probably would have worked out pretty well yep. for us yep. this year huh didn't work out yep <laughs> hence the diversify certain percentage of your acres that's that's my philosophy right or wrong and then cover crop on corn here's I'll let Zach explain it, but it sounds like he did like 25 feet or something like that here yep. on the front. So this kind of shows you what the corn dealt with this year. You can see the level of that corn. And then right over there is where the cover crop wasn't. You can uh, see the difference in between the two corns and then especially where Zach's standing, uh, there's supposed to be corn there. And that's where a heavy cover crop was. So that's an issue with uh, dry weather and uh, cover crop when you're trying to grow corn. Absolutely, this is this was all terminated uh, two weeks prior to planting, but we can just see there was there was a lot of cover crop out here. We just lost a lot of soil moisture that we just, we couldn't afford this year. And clearly as we move where there was no cover crop, I mean, there's there's 240 bushel corn and here's nothing. Yep. So. So now we're into the fungicide, I guess, block on the corn, mm -hmm. which there's a few things that I want Zach to cover on this is that, um, a, what fungicide program should we be looking at this year? What diseases are we going to be looking at or looking for this year with a dry June? And then also timing, because a lot of corn was, since we had a really good planting window, or it was a planting month, basically, uh, a lot of corn went in really quickly. Maybe airplanes and helicopters are super busy. Maybe you've missed the VT timing. 
um, things along those. When uh, should we maybe be looking at the window for applying fungicide? Like we haven't got any fungicide on our corn yet. It's coming up here really soon. Those type of things. So it's your show. Yeah. So um, we, you know, kind of kind of starting off, you know, what, what do we have out here? We just, this is just a whole bunch of different fungicides applied across this corn. So we just mix them up and just uh, we apply the center two rows so that we have a nice little buffer between each plot so that we can actually see that through the growing season. So that's always kind of cool. Again, we got about every product that you can really think of um, from, from really cheap products all the way up to really the most premium products on the market. So, um, you know, if we, we step over here to kind of obviously this one here, Miravis Neo, um, you know, this would be a, a Syngenta fungicide here. Um, this would be kind of our top of the line, you know, Cadillac fungicide that we have. And this would have been applied about a week ago. So I did shoot for that VT timing. So when I see the first tassel start popping up, I go and mix. And then hopefully, you know, when I come back in a day or two, uh, all this stuff's ready to go. So, and that actually worked out pretty well this year. Um, we can see we're actually still in pollination. Um, you know, we haven't hit that brown silk. So we've hit some really beautiful weather. I think that's been a saving grace. It's not 105 degrees when we're trying to pollinate like it was last year. That wasn't a ton of fun. But, it's um, supposed to be 105 like next week, basically. So, yeah. so hopefully this is all done by then, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> but uh, you know, looking at you know this, what we like to do is we just like to follow this through the season. We just put the product out there, just like we do with the herbicides, and follow it throughout the season. Um, so, some things that have shown up early, you know, before we got this uh, fungicide applied, we got a little bit of gray leaf spot here um, showing up. Uh, I've seen a little bit of rust. Rust is one of those things when you hold the leaf up you can kind of see it showing up there and there. So that's kind of an easy way to see rust. It actually highlights all your lesions pretty well. So a little trick if you're ever sitting in a cornfield and you're having a hard time seeing those lesions, just hold them up to the sunlight and you can see them a lot better and it makes it easier to pick out. So those have been the two diseases so far. There is tar spot down here. I'm, I'm sure everybody that it farms in the Midwest knows what tar spot is by now. It's kind of been you know a, a disease that kind of blew up really quickly mm -hmm. and been very very detrimental to us trying to grow corn. Um, but let's talk about timing, because I think that's that's something that's so, uh, it's kind of a hot topic. There's some folks bleed brown silk. Um, a lot of folks like to push it earlier. Um, we've seen the industry moving forward towards that VT, really because we have products with a lot more horsepower out there too, to kind of carry us longer through the season. So, you know, say we haven't got on at tassel or, or gotten on, you know, prior to brown silk, is there still a lot of value in the fungicide? You know, if you got a really good crop, I'm looking at this crop, it's a really strong crop brewing here. Um, 100%, it still validates that fungicide. So we there's a nice little response curve with everything. So nitrogen, you know, potash, all that. Well, fungicides have one too. And what we see is the optimum time for a fungicide is actually somewhere between V V12, so about two collars or three collars before tasseling and tasseling. That's the optimum time frame. As we go further out in the season, we see less response to that fungicide, right? It's not gonna be able to give you the plant health and all those other protections that you're getting. So even if we're out here, R1, R2, do we still see benefit? 100% we do. Um, do you see that 100% benefit? Maybe not. Do you see maybe closer to 90% benefit? Absolutely, that's where we're sitting. Now, if you're waiting till R3, R4, R5 to put on your first shot, yeah, you've probably waited too long to get that huge benefit. So. Um, really, if you're if you miss that window for just say tasseling, I wouldn't say you've lost that whole opportunity for still a great response from a fungicide. So if we're going to be pushing towards brown silk, which is brown silk R1, technically, yeah, when the when the silks turn brown, you're probably in R1. R1. Yeah. Should we be moving you like from maybe a top of the end line fungicide to maybe a a lower end fungicide, or even with the heat coming on next year or next week? during pollination is just maybe some stress relief from the fungicide gonna help out the corn. So um, I think as you wait, the longer you wait, so say you're getting out there R3, R4, um, are you gonna see less benefit from a fungicide? Absolutely, but will you still see more benefit from the premium fungicides? Yes, you will. Okay. You will still see more benefit because of these, these have an extra component to them a lot, which is that third mode of action. And what it does is two things. A it gets in this plant and it stays around for a long time. So it binds in that wax layer so the plant doesn't eat it up and you know, make it so it's not working anymore. Um, 
but also it's given a lot of plant health benefits. So even in those hot stressful conditions, or even as we get into R1, R2, we still see a lot of benefit from these premium fungicides due to the plant health side, as much as we get from the disease protection side. Because keeping these plants healthy, it's like us. The, the more stress we face, the easier we are to get sick. If we can keep these, take away a little bit of stress off this corn plant, it's gonna, it's gonna give it two forms of protection. A, the plant's healthier, it can fight off the disease, and B, we physically have a fungicide in it to help fight off the disease. So it's kind of a two-fold deal there. Well, what should we be looking for this year? Obviously, tar spot, if you get tar spot. Tar spot is tar spot our biggest yield robber right now if you get it in your field? Yeah, so tar spot, hands down, biggest yield mm -hmm. robber that I've seen. So we've, we've, we have a lot of personal experience. I'm originally from a farm in southwest Wisconsin. Um, 2018, we got tar spot and we raced 100 bushel corn. We've never raised 100 bushel corn. We're usually in that upper, you know, 180, 190. You know, we farm some nice fun slopes. You get to farm some of that mm -hmm. too. Um, but, you know, uh, we we did do some fungicide stuff. We've been doing it and we've consistently seen over 200 bushels when we're actually spraying that fungicide because tar spot really mm -hmm. does rob a lot of yield. There's some other big diseases I think that are on the watch out with this. We've had really high dew points. We have a lot of humidity. Northern corn leaf blight, that's still one of the biggest diseases when we talk about a lesion. I mean, that lesion can physically just, you know, when it takes up a leaf, it'll take up from here to here sometimes, and it's just destroying all that green tissue. So a northern corn leaf blight, if you get, correct me if I'm wrong, looks like a cigar. It looks like a cigar. It yep. looks like a cigar on your plant. And then you get, uh, you have to watch out because sometimes you think rust is rust, but it's just like pollen, isn't yeah. that correct? Yeah, it'll be just pollen sitting on there. And then sometimes people think that uh, they have maybe tar spot and it's fly crap, correct? Yep. So, That's very true. <laughs> so you got, there's things that you have to watch out for, but Northern is a big cigar. And then uh, what was the other one that uh, we were gray talking Gray leaf spot. Gray leaf spot, we dropped it, it was on this plant. Yeah, we, I was so, probably playing with it too. Uh, there it gray is. leaf spot is more, isn't that what you can, how, how do you identify gray leaf spot over northern? So when you look at gray leaf spot, it'll stay in between the veins here. So this okay. would be a very young lesion. That's why we're not seeing the gray in between it, but it'll stay in between these veins, right? We got veins that run up and down this corn plant. Yep. Gray will stay right in between those veins. When we look at northern, it'll just kind of take over that whole thing. It doesn't care about the veins. It just goes right in between over them and really does a lot of destruction. Yeah. So gray is, is Iowa's most common disease, but when Northern kicks up, we can see some really bad detrimental uh, uh, yield effects on our crop. So tar spot, most aggressive. I think it's top of everyone's mind because A, we don't have a lot of hybrid resistance yet. Mm -hmm. I think we're getting there. Give us five more years in the industry. I think the industry will have really good tar spot hybrids. Um, but gray leaf spot, Northern corn leaf blight, two diseases absolutely rob a lot of yield from our crops. So with the oddball growing season again, that's what we're trying to learn. What, you know, on a scale of one to 10, what do you think we're seeing for disease pressure chances this year? Oh man, you say you could give me, if you can give me an accurate 10 day <laughs> forecast of the weather, I could probably give you a better, better prediction. But you know, I think there's a still a lot of disease potential out there, unfortunately. Um, you know, I think, is it as bad as we've seen, say, back in, uh, what was it, 2020? We had that really wet mm -hmm. June, and we had really bad tar spot. No, I don't think we're there. Do I absolutely think there's a lot of disease potential out there? Yeah, because we're, we saw it show up so quickly after we caught those rains, which means these plants were probably infected. They were just waiting for the condition to turn right, really, to try to get to that last step, right? The, the lesion is the last thing we see in the whole process. Just because we were dry does not mean that our disease pressure is going to be low for the year. No. It's, that doesn't, it, and is it a good like example kind of showing like how did the disease spores and stuff like that move by the smoke that's come down from Canada? Is that, is that a, like, is that kind of the same thing how it moves like how the heck is the smoke making from canada it's like well how does the disease move yeah. from the south up it's yeah so that that's a that's actually a great point right that smoke it think of like southern rust coming from arkansas right southern rust does not physically overwinter in this in the midwest but it blows up if we get a hurricane which is crazy that a hurricane in louisiana will influence how much disease we get in iowa it's kind of a crazy thing to think about but it just blows that disease up tar spot you can have it in your field, your neighbor can't, won't have it, and it can physically blow from your field into their field, which is which makes some of these diseases a lot more challenging, tar spot specifically, mm -hmm. so challenging as it just moves via the wind. So that's a great example, thinking about that smoke, because we saw that for two weeks yeah. where we didn't see the sun, so. 
Do you think the smoke actually affected crops at all or a little bit or no? I think it did, um, mainly just due to the fact that we had heat. Um, we didn't really have a lot of moisture during that time, but we did we did have the heat. But our GDUs, right, these are these are solar panels. Yep. If there's no sun to give us the the you know photosynthesis, making our sugars and stuff, I saw a lot of crops that stalled out for two weeks, didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So um I think it did affect us, but at the same time, I think we caught some rains in the right growing conditions that I think we just got to hope for a little bit later of a growing season just to try to finish out some of these plants because they did get a little delayed overall. I mean, we should be done pollinating by now, yep. but we're, we're almost the last week of July here and, you know, we still got a lot of pollination that's to be had. We should be way done pollinating by now, especially with as early of a planting season as we were given, Absolutely. If, if that makes sense. So if we look at these two uh, signs right here, this will be just kind of like something that you did seed treatment wise to protect later on in the year. Saltro for soybean cyst nematode and sudden death. Do you think we got a sudden death year coming on? I think we could. So sudden death does infect early. And then when we really see the foliar symptoms start showing up is when we get some of these late rains. So with how early we planted and there was still really good moisture in the soil and it was still pretty cold, I do think we actually have an SDS year potential, even though it's been a drought ever since, you know, the two weeks after planting it from till recently, it's been a drought. I think there's still a lot of potential there. Mm. Um, I even, I even planted some stuff. I think it was the second week of April that is actually trying to see if we'll get SDS here. Oh yeah. Then we've got Cruiser Max Apex, which we also use this as a treatment that should help against Pythium. Yep. And I thought, that should help against Pythium <laughs> and Phytophthora. There we go. How do you want to describe that? Yep, so they, they both kind of infect at different times. So last year when we saw our Phytophthora, you know, we were walking uh, some of your stuff over there. We saw some of that stuff. Was a really warm, wet year. Um, what we see with Pythium is a cool, wet year. So actually it's kind of buffering you there from both of those diseases, but also there's some other products in there, um, you know, in that whole premix for things like Rhizoctonia, um, which is kind of, one of those diseases that kind of nibbles away, it's not a big killer, um, and a few other diseases we're gonna pick up. Plus that has an insecticide in it for you know, some of our, our bugs that we always are dealing with. My beans last year had really bad pythium, correct? Phy yes, or pythium. Or, and a little bit of phytophthora. So it was like, you could just walk through my beans and just find way more just dead beans than you would want to be. It's like, they looked like they cured up a month ahead of every time, everything else. It wasn't sudden death by any means, it was just, the beans died so yeah. that's what made cruiser max apex an interesting treatment so the next one we need to talk about is bugs we gotta talk bugs. gotta love bugs right? we gotta talk bugs <laughs> usually people think of when they're doing the fungicide and pass they're also gonna marry it with an insecticide pass mm -hmm. some people say that the fungicide insecticide actually helps them work together yeah is it correct so what are we looking for for bugs this year yeah so um Kind of focusing on soybeans right now, the biggest bugs that I have seen hands down are Japanese beetles. So we're gonna see if we can move these without these guys moving away on us. Um, oh, they're flying away. So Japanese beetles, hands down, probably one of the more um, destructive of our pests here in Southern Iowa and really Eastern Iowa in general. Um, we're pretty close to the Mississippi, so we really get Japanese beetle pressure faster than other areas. Big defoliator though, um, you know, that's what you're seeing here. You can see the defoliation, um, you know, especially this one right here. Look how much they've, uh, they've really defoliated that soybean plant. Um, now this is still very minor damage, but as this would continue to progress, that's where we would actually see it getting, you know, yield limiting and detrimental. Um, and then there, there's a few other pests out here, but I'd say Japanese beetle hands down biggest. Do you think we would get aphids this year with the dryness? Yeah, actually, so Northern Iowa did see a lot of aphids already. Um, Minnesota, I think they were having some pretty bad aphid pressures, so that really dry dry spell aphids were becoming a big issue. Um, further north, the further south we go, aphids just have a harder time getting down here. But I mean, if we looked hard enough, we could probably find them somewhere in the area for sure. So what are, uh, and if you're looking for aphids, you kind of look at the bottom side of the leaf and you just look for 
pretty much little green neon dots and they'll be on the stems as well. Yep, yep. So the, the place that they love is the new green tissue. So you just kind of look for these newest trifoliates and then as you would fold them out, you would see kind of little lime green dots. Obviously we're not, we're not really seeing any on any of these soybeans um, if you want to pick a, but just look for this newest green tissue. They'll be all over the bottom side of them. Um, and they can even kind of make it a little sticky. Um, you know, corn aphids, they, they produce a honeydew and kind of make things sticky on mm -hmm. your hands, so. So what products are you liking to spray for bugs this year? So what I use this year on some of my beans, or some of my beans I didn't, uh, depending on where I was in the plot, but uh, they, we have a new product, Endigo ZCX. Um, that was actually a really good product that I saw um, really give us residual for Japanese beetles. A lot of products have knocked down the one thing I like about that Endigo ZCX has really good residual. Um, and we kind of saw that as we were looking around a little bit of the plots that were sprayed with it and weren't, these plots weren't, uh, you just find more Japanese beetles kind of hiding in this plot that wasn't sprayed with it, so. Uh, fungicide application time coming on soybeans. Mm -hmm. How are we, how should we stage that? Yep, so, you know, if we, we're looking at these beans here, um, you know, beans have been growing quickly, so I think it's going to be a little tough to kind of stage beans overall because depending on how fast these things were growing. But realistically, you know, we're looking down here, we're in that R3 growth stage, we're past flowering, we even have some, you know, we got some bigger pods forming down here, but we got some of those uh, small pods right up in here, up getting close to the top. So we're at an R3 timing, um, perfect time to really make that fungicide application, protect it through flowering and reproduction as much as possible, give that plant health benefit, but really keep the diseases away. For the people that have a hard time, like you said, it's gonna be challenging this year, mm -hmm. staging R3, what should be their big one that they should look for at staging R3? Or how would you describe R3 in soybeans? Yep, so so R3, you would technically be having, you know, little 3 16 inch pods down here. Um, so that's what we're seeing on these plants here. You know, you can see the flower was there and now we got pods forming. You can see these flowers here. If this was fully flowered all the way down, it would be R2. But since we have these little pods starting to form here, um, these beans would actually be an R3. So this would be perfect time for a fungicide and insecticide pass. Yep. What are you liking for your fungicide on your soybeans? So my, my favorite fungicide, um, you know, we, there's a lot of really great products out on the market, but my favorite fungicide, we, we use it on our own farm, Miravis Neo. Uh, been a really consistent product. Again, it's got uh, multiple modes of action for residual and for knocking disease out. And that's really, and it's also got multiple modes of action that are affecting plant health, which you think about a soybean plant, right? It doesn't stop growing until it's ready to die. That's when it's gonna stop. So keeping these things healthy through August, they're gonna continue to grow. The more they grow, the more no nodes we can push on, the more bushels we can get. And maybe some of the late rains we could catch capture to really push it on that would be helpful. so soybeans <laughs> check so and then maybe as a little bonus if you're going to incur the expense of the fungicide and insecticide and having the trip out there maybe something you might want to think about mm -hmm. is a late season biological to kind of push those soybeans um, something that i've heard is that soybeans can kind of support themselves to that 65 70 bushel mark and then after that they might need a little bit of help to yeah. kind of go over that and one way you can maybe do that is with the biological you want to talk about this one yeah so what we have out here um this is our fungicide block what we actually have out here with our fungicide so this would be miravis neo applied at r3 but we also put a product called yield on in there and that would be uh biological from Vallegro. um it's kind of interesting, you know, biologicals are, are really new. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a weed scientist by trade, so um, definitely something new for me. But biologicals are just something kind of interesting because what we're doing is we're taking natural parts of plants and then kind of incorporating them into a, a solution that we can actually see if we can take the best parts of those natural plants and put them out here on this crop to see if we get the same response. Um, I think biologicals are, they're so new, there's not, you know, a, a huge track record of data on it. But I think it's definitely something that as we keep moving forward in this industry, looking at sustainable solutions, you know, all those other things that are, um, you know, kind of being looked at in the industry, I think this is some place that might continue to grow. So there we go. I guess we've learned this year, fungicide on corn, still a good option. Diseases are going to be prevalent even in a dry year. Weed control was hard this year, about everywhere. Um, 
maybe things you have to think about going into next year if some of those weeds survived. Uh, we are also looking at then fungicide. It's about time to go on the on the soybeans and the insecticide pressure is there or insect pressure is there on on uh, the soybeans as well. So just because the dryness early on hasn't really mitigated any of the stresses that we have to look for uh, late season with our crops this year. So still get your fungicide on, get your insecticide on. Would you say? I'd say absolutely. I think invest in the crop and agronomics usually show us that they give us good return on investment. So, well, I think that'll do it. Uh, fun little first time I've ever been here. Nice little plot that gets put on here. So thanks for hanging out with us. We'll see you guys in the next one.